All right. All right, so Veronica and I are doing our best to get this live streaming. I don't know if it's, it doesn't appear to be live streaming properly, but we are recording this uh, first inaugural episode of Let's Talk and the universe is making us really work for this conversation. So we're gonna make sure that it is a luscious and, and uh, chock full of deliciousness. We're talking about tea today. We're going to just fill it up with all that goodness. So I'm Amalia Natalia of Karmic Kindness. And with me is Veronica Manuel from T minus one. And Veronica, thank you so much for being here with me today and for hanging through all of our snafus that we've had, but we are here and we are going to rock this. We sure are. And I'm so grateful for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. You are welcome. You're welcome. So like I mentioned before, this is the very first episode of Let's Talk. And my intention with Let's Talk uh, is really to bring in people. It's similar to what I do on my podcast, Soulful Sessions, but more, this is more of a, um, I want to say mainstream kind of a vibe where, you know, bringing in people from all different areas of life and just talking about their magic, what they bring to the table, whatever that might be. So if anyone is watching this or sees this later and they are interested in coming on, let's talk and sharing about, you know, their gifts and the, their passions and things that really light them up, please send me a message. I would love to, to chat with you and see if you're a good fit for let's talk. Uh, so for Veronica, though, she and I met um, a few uh, weeks ago, maybe a few months ago now, and she, with through a mutual friend, and I tasted her matcha green tea latte, and she makes her own milk, guys and gals, and it's it's this st like. I don't even have the words. Like, as you can see, I'm like stumbling over it. It is just so good. It's got this, a hint of sweetness and there's this um, texture to it. That's really, really lovely. I'm going to let Veronica describe a little bit more about the milk, but I think it's a combination of the milk and then the tea and the tea she grinds herself. She is like the tea goddess, if you will, of the matcha green tea space from my limited knowledge and experience. So no pressure, Veronica, on that. Yeah. So, so oh. tell us, tell us about it. Tell us about like how you, how you got into it and, and about the green tea latte for folks who might be interested. Yeah. So I first got into matcha by taking tea ceremony lessons at Murakami Japanese Museum and Gardens in Delray Beach, Florida. And I fell in love with all kinds of Japanese teas, but especially matcha, which we prepare in the tea ceremony in a very ritualistic and traditional fashion. And so I wanted to bring matcha to more people and I decided to start grinding it fresh here in Florida, which to my knowledge is a very rare uh, thing to do. Uh, so I imported a granite Ishi Usu stone melt and I imported it from Japan. I had to fight through customs to get that here and uh, submit all sorts of paperwork. But when it finally got here, I was able to melt Tensha green tea leaves from Japan into matcha. And I started serving those in matcha lattes. So the secret recipe for that latte that you love so much is a milk made of cashew and coconut. And it's a cashew coconut honey and that makes a silky milk and a little bit of coconut sugar that adds a little bit of a, kind of a umami sort of taste to the milk. And I pair it with the matcha so that it doesn't overpower the matcha. And um, every, I would say half gallon has uh, 20 grams of matcha. So it's a, a very matcha forward drink. So yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it really is. What struck me is that it is really uh, smooth. You know, for people who are, are vegan, this is a great alternative. Uh, it's also, if people, you know, for me, I'm very sensitive to caffeine. So I did feel the caffeine in this because there was a, a, a strength to the caffeination, but it wasn't the same as you would get from, um, I don't drink sodas or anything like that, or energy drinks or those sorts of things, but I do drink coffee. Um, so, and I usually do half calf. So it's half caffeinated, half regular. And I definitely felt it, but it wasn't this like, 
oh, my heart's racing and I felt really jittery. It was just like, oh, I could feel that. So um, for people who really like that caffeine buzz and they aren't as sensitive to it as I am, I think it, it's a really nice um, natural way to give yourself a little bit of a, of a boost. Uh, and the beautiful thing, and I'd love for you to speak about this, Veronica, too. I mean, there's so many things I want to uh, touch on, but for those people who may be listening to this and think, okay, well, that's really cool, but I don't live in Delray. So how am I going to experience this myself? Um, you know, maybe you can't get Veronica's milk ordered, but you can order the tea and it's very simple to make yourself. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about um, where people can find the tea, we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of it too, but where they can find it if they're like ready to, to pop online and grab some now just from what we've been talking about. And then talk a little bit about the preparation. It's not as daunting as some people think when they think matcha green tea. Right. Right. Yeah. So you can find my tea at t minus one.com. That's T E A M I N U S O N E.com. And actually, there's a discount code that I created for Amalia's podcast listeners and for listeners of this show. And it's soulful15. So S O U L F U L L. So soulful as in full with two L's and 15 to get 15% off anything on the website. And you can, of course, find excellent matcha from other retailers online. My main suggestion is to shop on a place that is selling in Japanese yen because your credit card can do the foreign exchange transaction, but you'll really know that you're getting a high quality import of matcha if you're buying in yen. And you're probably shopping on a very reputable website in that instance. So with that, I, I definitely wanted to talk a little bit about the history of matcha. I know that there is uh, some drama in the history involving uh, a suicide of a Zen monk and all sorts of um, nobility drinking this tea from Japan. Um, so it all starts in the ninth century where Zen priests went over to Japan and uh, they brought back um, in cultural envoys uh, bricks of tea from China. And then in the 12th century, the Chinese did start to uh, steam and pulverize their tea. So a lot of people think that matcha was invented by the Japanese, but actually this is a Chinese innovation. And so they would prepare with a whisk, what is called mud tea or tea mud um, in a bowl. And this is the way that I recommend preparing matcha at home. So if you order one of these teas, then uh, from myself or other retailers that you prepare it with either a wooden bamboo whisk, which we call a chasin, or an electric whisk is fine. Even a spoon or a fork, if you don't have a spoon, you can just whip it around in a cup uh, in a bowl and then pour it over your favorite vegan milk or whole milk works great too. You can even steam and uh, the milk and create a matcha latte or a matcha cappuccino style. So actually it's very interesting because around this 12th century, we had the samurai warriors starting to drink matcha. The Zen priests introduced matcha to the samurai. And so the drink of matcha remained only a drink of nobility and the warrior class and the Zen priesthood for several more centuries until the 18th century. But in the 16th century, we had this Zen priest uh, or a, a tea ceremonialist named Sen no Rikyu, who was very, very famous in Japan for kind of combating the very luxury status of matcha. And he kind of wanted to return to a more austere aesthetic of matcha, which is called wabi. Wabi meaning, uh, and from wabi-sabi, meaning the joy of being alone in nature. So this feeling of the austere, the natural, the simple was kind of celebrated again by this uh, Zen priest and, uh, and Zen practitioner, Sen no Rikyu. And he worked under a Lord named uh, Hideyoshi. And Hideyoshi and him were very powerful because the Lord had a lot of political status in Japan. But because Seno Rikyu was very stubborn and independent and was starting to get famous on his own right, Hideyoshi and him had some arguments and crucial differences in opinion. And 
asked Senoriki to commit suicide by ritual, ritual suicide with a dagger, which is called seppuku. So this history of matcha and the tea ceremony, tea ceremony is very interesting. It's full of this drama because there was for so long, the noblemen and the politicians and everyone of high stature getting this fine import from China. It wasn't until the 18th century that matcha became for everyone in Japan because there was an invention of the processing called the Uji process and matcha was able to be created in Japan. So, uh, you know, I thought that you would find that history to be a little fascinating. It, it is fascinating. I did not know about all of the drama around the history of, of matcha. I mean, I think most of us just assume, oh, I mean, Japan and matcha, to, in my mind, is synonymous. I think for most people, that would be the case. Yeah. Uh, China is known for tea, but I wouldn't necessarily connect it with the matcha. So that's a fun fact. And no idea about the drama and death surrounding how this became, right. you know, something that was more commonplace in in society um in japan and now here you know it is you hear about it what what, what would you say to people uh, when it comes to like a green tea or a matcha latte at starbucks perhaps versus i mean obviously you're the i've tasted both and there is a distinct difference between what you you offer and what starbucks offers but what would you um, say from your experience would be the difference between the, the two as far as um, the ingredients and the pro taste profile? Yeah, so um, first off, Starbucks adds sugar to their matcha. I've asked for it unsweetened, but I think the matcha that they get is already mixed with sugar. Mm -hmm. So there is an automatic sweetness and a different kind of vibration that you get from drinking a sweetened beverage versus an unsweetened matcha beverage. I definitely want to applaud Starbucks for having matcha for so long, where most other specialty coffee shops didn't know of matcha, didn't serve matcha until more or less recently. And matcha is really, because it hails from a beverage for nobles in Japan, is kind of like this fringe really amazing beverage that Starbucks has created mainstream. And then now we have a lot of people in the US who are discovering this green drink. So at Starbucks, I would find the matcha a little less powerful, more sweetened, less umami, we call it, or earth tone, but a little bit more light caffeinated and uh, just not so matcha forward. And then what I create, I try to really uh, showcase the matcha. And by doing that, I uh, am using cultivars that are more powerful, more umami. So I have uh, different strains, if you will, or cultivars of different matchas. And I, I choose Samidori cultivar for matcha to highlight that strong, but, but refined and sweet uh, matcha flavor. And that's beautiful and green. And I add more of the matcha to it. And I, I make the milk recipe a little thinner to let that matcha shine shine through you know oh okay that's interesting so for folks who are looking to purchase your matcha and make it at home you know keep that in mind you know that maybe you your recipe might be adding a little bit more matcha to it so that you can actually taste it and experience it differently than maybe if you would go to starbucks where it's going to be a little bit um maybe a little bit more watered down perhaps or at least flavor profile wise and definitely sweeter because you're right there's i've asked the same thing you know no sweetener or less sweetener and it's still pretty sweet so there there must be some sort of something in it already yeah definitely yeah and you can always drink matcha with water uh, i drink matcha neat every day i whisk the matcha in a ceremonial fashion i don't always do the whole chano ut ceremony but i use the chas and whisk because i like a foam on my matcha. And when you whisk it, you can make the matcha foamy without milk. And it totally changes the flavor to aerate it a little bit, kind of like a fine wine where you decant it and expose it to the air. So the matcha, when you whisk it, and then you get this nice little frothy layer, it's like a cappuccino, but a matcha cappuccino. Nice. Oh, that sounds so delicious. Like now I want to go run over to you and have, have you make me one. Uh, so, okay. Another, I have another question about the ceremony. So sure. you mentioned, would you chasen cha cha yeah. ceremony? So what, 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 what does that entail? 
Yeah, so uh, we call it uh, cha no yu. Uh, we do use a cha sen west, but okay. um, the, the tea ceremony involves basically, uh, I would call it a choreography, but to call it a choreography is to omit the fact that it is a Zen practice. So it really is a mindful, a meditative style of a practice of the Zen Buddhism strain to uh, be able to prepare a bowl of tea with a lot of insight into the mind into the tea itself, the, the music of the tea ceremony without the music of maybe a speaker and picking something on our playlist. So it is kind of like a poetry in motion in this sense. And I really find the tea ceremony beautiful, especially the full Chanoyu tea ceremony involving a lot of decorum for showing respect to a guest where we would turn certain ways in the room or show the bowl, the front of the bowl, the design on the bowl to the guest in a very decisive manner. We have these cultural cues to show a lot of respect and then also to have a very quiet quality time together. That's really what it's all about. I love that. And I love the, the thoughtfulness, the mindfulness I'm even going to go so far as to say the soulfulness of the of the ceremony of the ritual and thinking about that in terms you mentioned that you make yourself a, a matcha neat matcha every day if you know so many of us make whether they we have tea or we have coffee or however we start our day most most of us have some sort of ritual or ceremony regardless of how we cat or we uh, label it and so if we were to take that time to really be very aware of how we start our day in that moment, whether it's our cup of tea or our cup of coffee or our juice, to really savor it and to be um, in the moment and the preparation of it, you know, pouring intention into that and the start of the day. I mean, it's a very simple practice and one that doesn't really even require any extra time. It's just a different focus of the mind and the intention and the energy that we're starting the day with. Uh, that would be, I think, kind of a fun, neat experiment for us to, to try, say, for a week or so and just see how that feels. You know, does, does your day progress more smoothly? Do you find more happiness in that day? Do you notice, oh, it's been kind of a smooth week this week doing this practice? Uh, or maybe you begin to notice things you didn't notice before, more of that, you know, expanded awareness, if you will. So uh, that's, yeah, it's really, it's such a, a thought provoking concept. And um, I also love the reverence that is given to the people there and also the tea itself. I yeah, definitely. We miss that oftentimes. We just take those things for, for granted, but it's, you know, it's coming from a plant and the plant is, is offering us its, its energy and its, its essence. Yeah, definitely. And in that ritual fashion, one thing that stands out to me in Japanese tea ceremony is that uh, we honor different seasons. We can honor the dead. We can honor different intentions, but not in the sense of an intention for the self, but maybe an intention of reflection on the past or the future and this uh, evanescence of things and, and of life, we can really start to, you know, look back 15 generations and celebrate uh, Seno Rikyu who gave his life uh, for his, his stubbornness towards macho, or we can, you know, honor, uh, you know, a season or even Boys and Girls Day in Japan. There's different ways to celebrate using Chanayu ritual. And I don't know if we really take the time during our mornings to examine that when we're making our, our beverages at home, but at the very least, we can quiet the mind a little bit and move a little slower and start the day that way, you know? Yeah. And, you know, what I think is so fascinating uh, is, and I didn't share this at the, at the beginning of our, of our conversation, but, you know, Veronica has her um, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from UVA. So we have a little bit of a connection because my daughter is graduating uh, next month and my son is just completing his first year at UVA. And you also have your an MBA from uh, Florida Atlantic University, FAU, here in Florida. And, you know, so if somebody were to look at you on paper, they would say, oh, well, you know, I, I kind of have a read on Veronica. She's very smart. She's very logical. And you would likely describe yourself the same way. 
And then there's this flip side of the coin of you that's also very much has been drawn to this um, more um, felt experience of the tea. Right, yeah. right. We can, yeah, definitely cleave off two hemispheres of the brain there and talk about it in uh, left brain, right brain, um, certainly. And also, I like to think of it as masculine and feminine energy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whereas the tea ceremony and also, also my tea sisters that I practice with, it, it is not just for women, men can practice too. And men have a lot of uh, high stature in tea ceremony, actually. But that you know, this, this feminine energy, the soft, the artistic side of the brain at work, that is really what the tea ceremony cultivates in me. And I do find that, uh, yeah, on paper that I have that kind of masculine energy at uh, the very logical, you know, uh, do, do solve the problems and the tasks in front of me and get the education and have that, you know, professional drive. But uh, yeah, certainly the tea has, and turning it into a tea business has kind of provided a beautiful mixture of that feminine and then the masculine energy, so to speak. Well, I love that you bring that up because when it comes to the, the masculine and feminine energy, we all, we all, regardless of whether you identify as a man or a woman, uh, need a balance in our life because the feminine is the receptive side and the masculine is the action side. But the action side doesn't really know what to do, where to go, where to focus without the receptive feminine leading the way. And oftentimes we find a lot of people going forward without an, an actual uh, intention or place in mind other than maybe, oh, I want this thing or I want to make this amount of money. But the, but the intention that and the motivation that lies underneath that is unknown. And so if we are able to balance that a little bit. And, and, and I think the T is a great practice for those who are a little bit more logic heavy versus feeling. It's a great way to do that really, really simply and get used to it. And it's a little bit of a, of a practice of that feminine muscle, if you will. Definitely. Yeah. And if you look at my kind of experience and my education, you would definitely see that more masculine side, but that I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And being an entrepreneur all along the way, I did work in academia as well, but uh, being an entrepreneur as a software programmer, I worked in, uh, I mentioned the coffee business, I think. Uh, my brother has started a coffee shop called Deeks in Delray, and uh, I worked alongside him for a while. So, and that was kind of a more masculine kind of environment as well. So then the tea was kind of a little bit of a response to the coffee side of my family and, uh, and also this desire to be an entrepreneur and do something a little bit more original and creative. And that creativity can be both masculine and feminine. And it's just the different tasks that arise during the day that would be defined as, uh, you know, in this Jungian sense of masculine or, or feminine energy, uh, if you will, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that's so true. And, and I'm glad you brought up your brother too, because I actually met uh, Veronica's brother, Nico, first before I met Veronica. And, uh, you know, it's funny, their mom's name is my name. So immediately there was this, this sense of, oh, familiarity or connection there. And then they're also from Virginia, similar to myself and find ourselves here in Florida. So it's just a, a lot of really beautiful synchronicities that brought us all together and how it all, it weaved that it's, you know, beautiful web of, of connection, which is really, really cool. Um, so Veronica, let me ask you one more question about the, the tea itself. And, you know, you know there's a ceremonial grade tea. I've heard that term used before. And what, what makes a, a matcha ceremonial grade? And is it better than, let's just say something you would get that doesn't have any labeling in that way on it? Yeah, definitely. I would say if you purchased a culinary grade matcha or even latte grade, which is intended to be paired with milk versus ceremonial grade, ceremonial grade is intended to be consumed with just water. So it should taste amazing just in water. And if you need to add sweetener or you're putting it in a, a baking product, uh, you know, cookies or brownies, then yeah, uh, the matcha is going to be sold more for volume and less for flavor. So it may be more oxidized. It may have started out as ceremonial grade, and then it 
became stale and then turned into culinary grade matcha. So you really, your taste buds will be the guide. Uh, I have tasted ceremonial grade matcha that was labeled that way that I would consider maybe a little more culinary grade, you know, so it is subjective, but at least when you're getting the ceremonial grade, you know, okay, I'm spending extra, but I'm going to get an extra benefit of flavor and also uh, micronutrients from the matcha. So micronutrients, I like the sound of that. So I know you and I had talked briefly about health benefits of green tea that some folks may not be well-versed in. What, you know, everyone knows like drinking tea is good for you, but what makes matcha good for you? Yeah, so matcha is very unique in its anti-cancer properties. Uh, I read three studies on PubMed about how matcha can combat cancer, both in breast cancer. So two of the studies were about uh, breast cancer. And then one of the studies was about cancer stem cells. So before the cancer cells differentiate into different kinds of cells in the body that the matcha can actually intervene and stop cancer, maybe not totally, totally in the body, but at least assist in other kind of preventative protocols. Wow. And even in Japan, that there is a saying, if you drink fresh matcha, then you won't get cancer. And this I learned from my tea sensei. And that certainly enough, when I researched it, there is scientific literature to back that up. Now, um, there is a lot of literature about green tea and weight loss. So you can actually maintain weight loss very well with uh, drinking green tea, including matcha, and include uh, in that list uh, losing weight around the midsection. So that's really good if you're looking for something to add to your diet that, you know, is a benefit to weight loss goals, like definitely consider matcha. And also it can help to lower cholesterol. And uh, it's a great way to get L-theanine, which is an amino acid that is a natural anti-stress, anti-anxiety compound. So the caffeine is not that sharp buzz, but it is kind of extended release because of the L-theanine binding to the glutamate receptors in the brain and suppressing like excitatory activity in the brain. So it has a lot of health benefits and you don't have all those fibrous uh, effects of drinking your greens. Uh, so it's a good way to conveniently drink your greens without having all of that, that fiber, you know. So I'd be curious and, and I'm, I, I may know the answer to my own question just by logicking it in my brain, but so if somebody were to use like the ceremonial grade is going to be really high quality. It's going to be a potent grade of the matcha. Yes. If you were to add that to, uh, something that you were cooking or baking, mm -hmm. it's, is it, I don't know that it would necessarily lose its potency because you're, when you make a tea, it's heated up also. Um, so what, what is your opinion or from your experience? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't bake with it because the baking is at such a high temperature and for so long. And really when you know about matcha, um, I'll explain the processing of matcha, what goes into matcha, okay. because when you know what goes into it, it's almost like sacrilege, right? To bake <laughs> with it, you know, okay. Um, okay. versus a, a real ceremonial grade matcha, you would want to drink with water at first. And really, if not water, then something, you know, milk or something that is warm to 185, 175 degrees, not much mm. higher than that. Gotcha. So you're really not destroying it too much. And the matcha is steamed already. So it's not really being destroyed so much as it's being brewed at those temperatures. But then certainly if you're cooking with it and your stovetop is 300, 400, then it's probably going to break down the matcha, although not as much if it is ceremonial than the culinary grade. Gotcha. Because that makes total, grade. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Okay. So would, would you mind sharing about the, uh, you know, the, the process? Cause I know you mentioned earlier that you bought a, a stone with some effort <laughs> to get it here yeah. that, you, that you use to grind it, I'm assuming. Yeah. I mill it and I did start out by hand cranking the mill. Um, yeah. So basically matcha starts out as being shade grown. So the shade growing of matcha improves the chlorophyll and the L-theanine in the matcha uh, in the green tea leaves themselves. And then after about three weeks of shade growing right before the harvest, once it's harvested, the leaves are steamed. 
and then steamed, dried, and then static electricity is used to further refine the matcha so that, uh, or excuse me, the aracha, the um, leaves before the, the unprocessed leaves, right? So the twiggy parts and the meaty leafy parts are separated and what you keep is the leafy delicious parts okay. and then um, that is tencha. Tencha is the phase the name that uh, the green tea has before it is milled into matcha which is milled tea and when it's milled it's milled to micron fineness so that really, really fine grind helps the body to absorb it really quick in a way like espresso. And it is kind of similar to espresso in that you do get that feeling that that buzz in a pretty quick way, but the it's you're drinking the whole leaf. You're not drinking just the extract from the water of tea. So you're getting a totally different beverage than just loose leaf tea. That's really cool. I didn't think about it in those terms that, you know, you are imbibing, ingesting the whole leaf. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And so much goes into the harvesting. I try to source hand-picked matcha so, or uh, hand-picked tencha leaves. So you can find matcha from several different regions of Japan. Some of the areas use tractors to harvest and some still hand-pick in the old-fashioned manner. And, you know, when, when I'm buying the hand-picked, you know, leaves and then I'm milling it fresh, I just don't want to bake with, with that product, you know, and similarly with other ceremonial grade matchas, I wouldn't recommend unless it is going stale or you don't really like the flavor, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I, I do understand what you're saying now, like after under, you know, having a, a, a better understanding about what goes into it and, and how much effort and energy it takes. It yeah. seems like it would be, it's kind of ruined. If you put it in something else, you it's losing its, its flavor. It's losing its luster in a way. And then you're destroying the, all the, the nutrient richness of it in the oven or on the stove. So yeah. that makes, that makes sense. So a, just a regular culinary grade would probably be just fine for cooking so you can get the flavor, but you don't feel quite so badly about, about it, the, all the effort that was made to bring it to that, to that point. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It may be, you know, machine harvested and whatnot. So. Yeah. So one other question, um, and maybe I'm making this up in my head, but you mentioned, um, the Tensha, isn't there something called Sencha? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so so can, what is that? Yeah, sencha is Japanese green tea. So it doesn't necessarily have to be shade grown. Um, it is not refined in the way that tencha is. Uh, and refined meaning, you know, that just the leafy meaty parts. So the, the sencha can be rolled. Uh, sencha is uh, often rolled and uh, it kind of looks like thin little needles of green tea. And then we brew that with water so that you're getting the green tea extract, but not drinking the whole leaf. So sencha is kind of an umbrella term. And then within sencha, you can shade grow it lightly and that's called kabusecha. You can shade grow it for a longer period of time and then it would receive a more elevated name and processing of a uh, gyokuro. You could have a more long-term steamed matcha, uh, sencha uh, or shorter steaming period. So it really, there's a lot of nuance to Japanese teas and there's a lot out there. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like it. So I think I can speak for myself with a limited amount of knowledge that I have around it. I mean, I know just this, like this much just from my, really one of my, one of my um, sons is really, really into tea and green tea in particular. Uh, and so, so is, you know, so is his dad. And so that's been a big part of their experience, but for my son in particular, matcha, he really enjoyed that for quite some time. Back when it was, he was, I think, in middle school or high school. So it was really unusual for him to be interested or even aware of it at that yes. age. You know, I yes. remember buying him the little set with the bamboo um, whisk and a really pretty bowl and that whole thing. And I thought, I don't even know what to do with this. So, but you know, even as a, a youngster, he, he was called to it. So this is really fun to have more of a sense of, 
of it then you know he shared a little bit with me but you've gone to a whole nother level of experience with it which is really really cool it's been very fascinating thank you yeah i i really love uh matcha both to drink and then also the art around matcha the history uh people's stories about matcha it seems when i meet people and i mention that i'm into matcha i get this like great reaction from some people like, Oh my God, I love matcha. I make matcha every day. Like you don't even know, you know, and <laughs> I get a lot of matcha nerds coming out of the woodwork, you know, and telling me that how much they love matcha. And, uh, I don't see that relationship with, uh, other kinds of tea as often. Uh, sometimes I hear this on, on the chai tea, you know, kind of topic, but, uh, yeah, matcha is, uh, it, I drink it twice a day at least. And I don't find that it keeps me up too much at night. So sometimes in the evenings I'll treat myself and, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I have a, a special cultivar that I drink at night and in the morning. So really, really try to deep dive into the knowledge there. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really cool, really fascinating. Uh, one final footnote before I'm going to let you share where people can find you again, but um, Veronica and I were invited to participate in a really special event for um, for really for women. Sorry, guys, this is just for us. It's a it's a women's retreat, quote unquote. It's an evening event at Dancing Lion Studio in Delray Delray Beach, Florida. And it, it honors women in general, the divine feminine. Uh, I know it's Mother's Day weekend, but you don't have to be a mom. Just come in and, and, it, and, and, and be part of that sisterhood, part of the celebration. Veronica is going to be sharing a tea and a tea ceremony, um, likely talking about a little bit about what we talked about today. And I am going to be sh sharing flower power, you know, the, 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 uh, essence of flowers and how they're supportive. I'll be talking about Lotus Way products, which is my go-to for any sort of flower power assistance support. Uh, it comes in elixirs and mists. I mean, you could even add it a couple of drops, a few drops to your, to your tea if you wanted to give it a little extra little oomph. Uh, to start your day or end your day, whatever the case may be. Uh, and there uh, is also going to be some meditation and movement led by uh, the owner of the studio. Some, um, trying to think some, also creating a sacred space, some, some uh, with an altar and chanting with another uh, wonderful uh, gal. I believe her name is Paula that's going to be sharing that. So it's going to be a really beautiful night for anyone who sees this and lives in the area and wants to come for in for some some sisterhood and some goodness it's going to be a, a great great evening that's may 6th from 6 to 9 p.m go to dancinglionstudio.com i believe is the website and you can find all the sign up info but veronica and i will be there so you can yes. come and hang out hang out with us it'll be really really fun yeah 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 uh okay so veronica wait, to remind people again where they can find you T minus one.com is where I sell my products. I also will be at the cocoa market this May 1st. I do a lot of pop-ups and markets. So I try to do my best to post those on my Instagram, which is T E A dot M I N U S dot O N E T minus one. And my website is spelled the same way T E A M I N U S O N E. So you can find me there T minus one.com and follow me on Instagram. I'm excited to, to meet more of you guys who are watching. Yes. Oh yeah. It's going to be an awesome event. Thank you again for being here. I look forward to more conversations and lots of tea drinking, whether we're together or in our own spaces, thinking about one another on, on occasion. And, yeah. you know, thank you all for listening and hanging out with us and spending this, this time with us on let's talk. All right. I, we will say bye for now. All right, yes. everyone. Bye. bye.